if you accumulate as much gold as possible, national economic policy. So, yeah, mercantilism, accumulate as much gold as possible. And that means they want more, what kind of trade? Oh, 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 I got this, I got this. <laughs> don't, don't. Um, someone beat you to it. Exports. What do they call a tax on imports? And what is a tax just on commodities, on goods? Excise tax. Yep. Actually, you know, when you go buy gasoline and pay the 70 cent tax, that technically is an excise tax. Even though you didn't even know, you know, they give you a couple price per gallon, but they just have the tax. And that is a compound bow. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. 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 I thought that was a new And that is a northeast, that's a Wapano on fort. So colonies will provide what to the mother country mercantilism? And what else? And what? And things? Not only raw materials and resources, but what else? Think about for trade. What else? Say it again. Well, they might provide ships and other goods. They make the manufactured goods in England. Yeah, the captive market. Someone might have said, and I just didn't hear it. The captive market. So not just raw materials. Then they make, you know, Britain would make India. I think, did I use Gandhi as an example on Friday? Yeah. Yeah, you'll make their colony buy goods at highly inflated prices. In 1898, when the United States was looking at becoming an imperial country too, and get an empire. One of the reasons they did it is because the United States was going through a whole, well, the world was, a horrific economic depression, panic of 1893. And they thought if we get colonies, no one has money to buy goods in the US, but we'll make the colonies buy goods. So that's why we would engineer a war against Spain to get the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Cuba, we just kind of, Took over and didn't totally colonize it. So that so these kind of thinkings will go on. Uh, something happened. It's happening right now about the America about Venezuela. So with that, that's mercantilism. What were the British laws that said goods can only be shipped on, on English ships and an excise tax? What was it? Yeah, the Trade and Navigation Acts, 1650s, and they also restricted colonial industry. But they didn't enforce them. What was it called? Historians would give it after the fact. They would call this when they would not enforce it and allow the colonies to develop a pretty unique economy. Salutary yep. Yeah. Yeah. Salutary neglect. Yeah. And does it look like the crescent moon? Yeah. It's a really that's a compound bow. Obviously, right? Let's start eating. Yeah. It doesn't look very good. I don't draw the same thing, though. All right, so we're right when the bell rang. I had to finish this. So the colonies developed unique economic systems. Did you get this at all? No. So we're going to make a table. So just imagine a table. This is the middle line. I'm saving ink. Very conscientious. The northern economy and the southern economy. And there's going to be many similarities. There's going to be differences. And you can't simply say that. All people in the North had the same economy, like Massachusetts or New York or Georgia or Virginia in the South. But this wasn't the plan for the British. They didn't want unique economies. They wanted to exploit them for their resources, and then we'll see what happens. Basically, then when they decide to leave. So the North, there's basically two reasons. First one, New England, two regions. New England. What's Colonies and then states would be the New England, would be New England. Massachusetts is the first one. So, we've got Mass. What else? Wyoming. What else? Massachusetts. What other states? Or colonies? And Wyoming and New Hampshire. No, Maine was then part of Massachusetts. Now we consider part of New England back then. Rhode Island and one more. Did someone say Connecticut? You did? Good. I thought I heard it, but... So Connecticut. That's New England right there. Vermont, 
was claimed by France, New York, New Hampshire, New Jersey, and they would become a state after the Constitution, so it's in 1791. So that's New England. And then the other area, there's there's other names we can give it, but generically we call it the Mid-Atlantic. Basically the middle of the Atlantic coast. And there are three states that are middle Atlantic states. You probably guess what they are, so let's hear them. Wyoming is one, and then what else? Hmm? What's it here? New York. What else? What state was made for the Quakers? Pennsylvania. And then a state that smells like in the north, toxic waste, and in the south, like cow manure? New Jersey. Yeah. Have you ever been to New Jersey? You'll know what I mean if you drive across New Jersey. Those are the Mid Atlantic states. And they're different. New England is very much remnants of their Puritan background. Here, you know, like New York City is very Dutch. It used to be New Amsterdam. In fact, to this day, it has a, has a very cosmopolitan feel like Amsterdam. You know, a lot of different cultures. And if you go to New York City, there are people from all over there. I mean, it's really something to see how cosmopolitan New York City is, much like Helena, right? And with that, People from all the world come to hell and that's Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's more like Billings. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Hold on. And by the way, you ever been to Amsterdam? Yeah. Really cool. Amsterdam, Montana, or the other ones? Hmm? I've been to both. I'm like, Did I tell you about Amsterdam? The only place I've ever been in my life where there was a significant number of women taller. Mm. I'm six three, and it's I mean, you know, just and there are a lot of women taller than me. And the men are all like five two. <laughs> no, the men are like six eight. And so it was just really something. It was just interesting going to Amsterdam. There's a lot of tall people. <laughs> A lot of tall Dutch, and they all speak about five languages. Very cosmopolitan place. When did you go? Um, oh, really? That's it's really a cool place. Yeah. Should we go field trip? Yes. Yeah. Carpool? Yeah. yeah. Carpool. Kind of Send my blockers. All right. So one important thing to understand about the North, like every place else in the world, is geography. The geography of the North is significantly different than the South. If you've been to that area, been to New England, been to much of Pennsylvania, it is very fertile land and it rains a lot, but there are low mountains everywhere. And so you have these really fertile valleys, but they're relatively small. And so you have small fertile valleys and then rugged hills. And if you go to the Appalachian Mountains, they like, oh, they're not rugged. They're nothing like the Rocky Mountains. If you don't have roads, they're rugged. And so in New England, in the mid-Atlantic colonies, for the most part, they're not good for the big plantations. And so they're going to be dominated by, because of their geography, small farms. Corn, beans, wheat, cattle, but small. Only in New Jersey and along the Hudson River in New York are you going to get the big, that's what's say small farms. That's supposed to be an S, but I have no idea what that means. Shut your eyes, everybody. Then open them and imagine the letter S. Does it work? Yeah. Power of positive thing. In New Jersey and New York, there are some big plantations. There were still slaves, slaveholders in New Jersey when the Civil War began. And people think of the slave states and free states. It's much more complex than that. But for the rest of it, small farms were so not good for the big plantations. They couldn't be big enough to afford to own the slaves because they're so expensive. It has to be big enough to afford that. So there would be slaves in every colony in the United States, but because they couldn't get big enough, you're not going to have as many slaves in the North. I repeat, there will be slaves in the North. 
and they will profit off the slave trade. But they're really expensive. You need a big farm to afford it. And then, that means there's going to be a lot of other things. With the vast forest, we're going to have a huge lumber industry. There's going to be shipbuilding. And by the way, these all violated the laws. Because of the mountains, there's going to be iron mines, so iron. Hat is good. Hats are going to be big business. Um, there's more. I'm just kind of giving you a, an idea of what they were. Fur, the fur trade, especially along the frontier, incredibly important. What animal? Hmm, someone said it. Yeah, kill as many beaver as possible. What do you get from beaver? You know, the fur. Yeah, if you ever seen a beaver pelt or, or pet a beaver, you know, the, the fur on the outside, they have basically two sets of fur. And the outside is very almost spindly. It's like really, because it keeps the water out, and underneath there's like a felt. And they would scrape off the top part and get to this felt. And that felt would be hats, beaver hats, or that, that means you made it because they're so expensive. You're wealthy, you had a beaver top hat. To the 1830s, that was the style of the wealth called the carriage trade. Then it went to silk. If it wouldn't have gone to silk in the 1830s, there wouldn't be a beaver left alive. Hey, so, which is sad because a few things in the world, world are cooler than a beaver dam. Anyone you know, ever walked across that seen, seen one of these? They're, they're really cool. They don't like trees. And I forgot now. Oh, fish! Fish dominated the market. All transactions were done by fish. Fishing was huge. The most the most valuable fishing area in the world, right here. So they fished it out in the 1920s. Industrial revolution and mechanization. Now they're just going spot to spot and fishing them out. That's our world today. And then, uh, but there, with, with this, oh, rum. Rum was big business too. Get the molasses and sugar from the Caribbean, make rum out of it. Basically taking something of a relative value and turn it into something of great value. Whiskey would be big business too, but a little bit later on. And then there's going to be a lot of merchants here. If you're gonna have this much more diversified economy, you need people to buy and sell goods. And so this would be more merchants and there's just gonna be more money in the North because there are just more of a variety of commercial activity. So that's the Northern economy. You should notice it's pretty diversified. Obviously, obviously not industrial revolution, not today, but pretty diversified. And then in the South, in the South we have two big regions. The region around the Chesapeake Bay is called the Tidewater. The Tidewater, so we have the bays and these rivers like the James that are very much affected by the tides. And what states are there? Around the Chesapeake Bay, yeah. So Virginia is the biggest, and it would be the biggest and wealthiest colony in the state for years until in the Industrial Revolution would begin to change. There are a couple more Tidewater states. <laughs> Think about Chesapeake Bay. What do we have there? What's right above me? Virginia. And Maryland. Slave state. Maryland very much is a border state. It's you have elements of the Mid-Atlantic and elements of the Tidewater there. And what's the other one? Very small little state. Delaware. Delaware is greatly affected by that's the Tidewater. So all three of those states, Maryland and Delaware, would both be slave states. Have slave codes, have the whole operation for slaves, but they stayed in the Union in the Civil War. Virginia left. And then we have a slave empire. Sometimes it's called a slave kingdom for the rest of the states. The Carolinas and Virginia. And North Carolina is kind of a split. They have some tidewater elements because they can grow tobacco there. But South Carolina and Georgia, and they're modeled after the slave kingdoms in the Caribbean. So they're modeled after Spanish or British, Ireland, like Jamaica or Cuba. 
And they operate very much like a big slave labor camp. And the legacy of this goes there to, to this day. Your Virginia is a southern state, but you cross into North Carolina and go into South Carolina, it's a radical difference. Just like I would say if you go over to Massachusetts, South of Pennsylvania, radically different. But the slave empire would eventually be Alabama, Mississippi, half of Louisiana, Arkansas, and a big part of Texas. It would all be a slave empire. And the legacy of that goes to this day. If you know anything about Southern politics in that area, yeah, there's a reason for that. And it goes back to here. And that's the South. There's going to be a lot more slaves there. It's different land. And we'll come back to this in just one second, but the geography is much different. Their geography, it's called the Piedmont. And the Piedmont is the name for this region right here. Basically right along the coast, here, between the Appalachian Mountains and the sea. It's much flatter, it's got broad, slow moving, moving rivers, kind of crossing it like this, kind of highways into the interior. Perfect for plantations. So everyone got that? It's perfect for plantation. So they're going to have small farms. They're going to have logging in the Appalachian Mountains. They're going to have a huge fur trade in the Appalachian Mountains. So those first ones I mentioned for the north, they're going to be here. But they're really out in the hinterland by the 1770s. Have you ever heard of the term hillbilly? That term comes from the 1760s and 1770s, kind of a derogatory name for them. You know, they're way out there. You can't control them. Do the mention, they'll take you that. Yeah, we're hillbillies. But it's here. But they're kind of out there. Here, plantations. So there is fur trade, so those basic things, but the main part of the southern economy, huge plantations. And Virginia would have the most because what's the first big cash crop? What do they grow? Tobacco. How do we spell tobacco? Ta back key. Tobacco. That's science. <laughs> tobacco. And tobacco, it grows in this latitude. So basically, Virginia, you go over the mountains, but you Virginia, northern North Carolina, I know that sounds weird. And Kentucky. That's tobacco. And then, not really cotton yet. Cotton was too hard to use. It would take the Industrial Revolution for cotton to become big. So then, Tidewater was much more profitable than the Southern colonies at first. Then cotton would change everything. But they would grow rice. And the big thing about rice, they would use it to sell to the slaves, especially in the Caribbean. And then what's the dye that would be so valuable that you could get in the swamp? South Carolina is really swamp. Lots of games. What's the dye? Yeah, indigo. Anybody know how you get indigo? What color is indigo? Yeah, like a dark bluish purple. It's a pretty color. Does anyone have it? A little bit too bright a purple there. Do you, know. you feel shame now? <laughs> It's a really pretty color. I, I can't really see it. It's really dark. Here's the deal. It only grows in swamps. I think if you see like a, a reeds. Think about a reed on top where the seed pod would be. They would cut it, which was awful. Backbreaking work. Thus, pretty much only slaves could do it because there's so much malaria in there, too. Only African slaves. They lay it out in the sun to rot. And I guess the smell would knock you out. And then they would beat them on rocks. So it's kind of rotten thing and a purple smudge would come and they'd scrape that off and it's worth its weight in gold. That's why kings, their color would be purple because that dye was so valuable. You ever see like a little picture of a king, of a, or a king or a queen with a purple robe? Yeah, that's why. And those are the main ones. Cotton's coming, but it won't be until 1800s. Industrial Revolution. So that's the big business. And the people who have the plantations, they have the wealth, the social, and more importantly, political power. One more thing. 
This is going to become a big business. Grab these plantations. The buying and selling of what will become huge business. Plantations. What do you need? Yes. What? Slaves will become maybe the most important business there. Slave trading is going to be huge. Huge. The buying and selling of people. That's going to be big business to bring them in to control the slave trade. Slave traders can make a lot of money. Plantation owners need a little bit of money. They can sell a slave, sell a kid, make a lot of money. Slavery is horrific in every way possible. And we'll talk more about that later on. But one important thing to know, and I'll come back to this idea because it's going to have such importance in American history. The idea, the American dream, up until the Great Depression in the 1930s, for people still have this idea they want to get a little piece of land and become an independent farmer. That would die with the Depression. So people, when they get money, they still want to act like they're farmers. But less than 1% of the population today make their living, their sole income from farming. Because it is incredibly difficult. And part of the reason why is farmers are constantly in debt. They might have wealth. I mean, they might have land wealth or wealth and slant. Excuse me, slaves, but they are in debt. They might have money because farmers, for the most part, in agriculture, you get money once a year, don't you? You harvest, you get enough money. For the rest of the year, you got to make do with that or borrow for just food, shelter, fuel, see whatever it might be. And all it takes is one bad year. One bad year. And what happens? Then you have to borrow money to pay off your last debt. And then it cycles and cycles. I mean, everybody's in debt. The farmers are really susceptible to it. So if you want to go borrow money from somebody, now then it's pre-banks. Someone borrow money in London or they borrow from merchants. Banks, there wouldn't be banks in the United States of the 70s and 90s. But if you want to go right now, what do you want to go to the bank? So walk in or go down to Stockman's Bank or Ralph, just a bank. Say, I want to borrow a million dollars. They'll say, fine. But we're not going to loan you that money unless you have what? What do they call it where you have to put something down just in case you don't pay back? You have heard the term collateral. Collateral. So you must pass something of value to say that if I don't pay back, pay back my debt, you get to keep it. You know, so if you want to go borrow money to buy a car, like a lot of times people go put another house or something else. That's collateral. Summer. Or if you get a credit card, you basically sign away your life. For a student loan, you sign away your life. That's your collateral. Your collateral is your life. I don't mean life or death, I mean they own you for the rest of your life. The fine print is terrifying. But I'm not kidding about that. Be very careful. But I got a one for you. Trust me. Think about slaves. That becomes a collateral. Slaves became the most important form of collateral. If they wanted money, they put their slaves down. That's collateral. So think about how important that would be. Slaves are not just there because you want to, it's expensive, but you want to find some way to force someone to pick your crops. It's also going to be used now as an important part of the entire financial system. Slavery will back up the entire financial system, especially because there's more slaves there of the South. If all of a sudden slavery disappears and they go from being property to being humans or whatever, it was still unclear what they would be, if they were going to be citizens or, citizens or not, even after the Civil War. Banks will get their money back. The entire system of credit would fall apart. They would lose everything. Plantation owners would lose their position in society, their economic, societal, political wealth. Slaves became the key to the whole system to them. And you want to know why they would fight so hard to keep that system? We talked a little bit with Bacon's Rebellion about why the poor were so desperate. Think about why the wealthy, that tiny percentage, without slaves, they could see it all fall apart. Know anything about what's going on with climate change and why the gas, why the petroleum companies are so desperate to say that it's not happening? 
because they have trillions of dollars under the, as they see it, under the ground. When people also decide that carbon is causing climate change, they lose that money. The similarity to slavery is actually kind of shocking. So what do they do? They want that money. So that kind of thinking does not go away. We all do a little bit of that. You know, we have something of value. We don't want to see it go away. Of course, this is one of the most horrific things you can imagine. So if you look at the two sides, then, north and south, which one will have the most cities? Don't think urban as in a modern city after the Industrial Revolution. But which northern or southern colonies will have the most cities? The north. So get that down. The north will be more urban. Why? Commercial centers. So you got that? The north will be more urban. There's a reason why cities form. It's a center for commerce. And one more thing. Let's say you lived in Britain. You live in Manchester, England in 1800. So the U.S. is just an independent country. But the colonies are now states. For immigration, you have nothing. Dirt poor. Most of the immigrants, immigrants have nothing. And you have the choice to go to either a northern state or a southern state. Which one would you go to if you have virtually nothing? If you go to the south, who has all the land? Look at that list of stuff. Which one would have more opportunity if you don't have much? The north. I can see where you're thinking south, but the north has a more diversified economy. And so get down, more immigrants will go to the north. When the Civil War, I'm sorry, when the Revolutionary War began, northern and southern colonies were relatively similar by population. But that's going to change dramatically all through this era because of the economies I just told you. By 1860, I'm sorry, 1861, what began in 1861? Revolution began in 1775, what began in 1861? Civil War. The population of the United States was about 32 million. I'm sorry, 31 million. 22 million of those lived in the north. The population in the north is going to grow significantly faster. By the way, why would eventually, in my lifetime, but not in yours, because now we're kind of used to it, southern populations will grow. All of a sudden, you have places where nobody would live, like in Arizona, all of a sudden people live there. They don't have water. They still don't. We'll have to deal with that down the road sometime. But why else did the people start moving to the south in the 1960s and 70s instead of the north? Air conditioning. The availability of air conditioning also the people start moving to the south. You kind of take it for granted, but that's why. And so, yeah, if you don't believe me, just spend it August in Mississippi. The average temperature? And I'm not, I'm not even talking about the wind chill. So with that, wind chill. So, got immigration, urban. There's also more finance there. This would be a big deal. And so think about when the colonies begin to develop. That 1700, red dots represent people. It's a little bit vague. It's supposed to be from a distance. And so colonies are forming, different economic activities. Farming, but why right along the frontier? It's happening both the north and the south. What is the most important activity? So, like in 1670, it's right here. The most important economic activity. Which one of those things we put down, the north and south? Or here? What is the most important economic activity on there? That would be on the frontier. In the first round. And so, to really get to what's going to happen when the United States becomes independent, we got to get to the first round. Who's killing the beaver? The tribes along the frontier. Those tribes right next to the edge of colonial America, they're the ones who are killing the beaver and trading. Does everyone got that? So we got the big, it's for beaver, and tribes along the frontier. So we're talking right along the edge of the frontier. They're trading for them. And think about what happened to the American Indian tribe. What happened to the vast majority of virtually all the American Indians? They're gone. In the north, all along eastern tribes, 
They lived in villages, cities, some were very big, walled cities. The Wapanoaks would have wall cities like this, and they're just kind of, they're kind of cool. So I drew one up here. They would go like this, and then the city would be here, and all this would be a wooden stockade. Clever, isn't it? If they attack and come in here, they just stand and be on top of the wall throwing stuff. Throwing big boulders on you. So you kind of funnel the any invading force into there and just destroy them. So they're pretty easy to defend. But here's the problem. If almost everyone's dead, it doesn't make sense anymore. Farming doesn't make sense. All the old things they used to do didn't really work. And here you have these dynamic colonies by the 1650s. They're growing food, and they're wanting things. But what they really want is beaver power. So tribes along the frontier, like the Wabanoaks here, or the Powhatans in Virginia, they're trading for fur, or trading for goods with fur. And think about it for a second. Imagine how difficult it would be to cultivate and grow corn, maize. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. If anyone's ever done a big garden before, wouldn't it be easier to kill one beaver and trade the pelt for a bushel of corn? Has anyone in here ever made a watertight basket out of tree bark? All of you? Is that safe to say? Can you imagine how difficult it would be to make that? And not only that, but to pass that skill on to your children and so on. Wouldn't it be easier to kill five beaver and trade it for an iron pot? Think how difficult it would be to make a compound bow for, a pair, for bow and arrow for archery. Learn how to use it and to pass that skill on. Shockingly difficult. Kill 15 beaver and trade it for a musket. Do you see what happens here? All the old skills, and this is what I want you to get down. What happened was very quickly, because of fur, all their old skills, I'm talking about their old culture, the skills of their old culture. What happened to all of them along the frontier? What happened to all those skills they once had? In one generation, all of them were mom. That's how fast it takes, one generation. If you don't pass that skill on, it's gone. It's just gone. If you ever hear people who are older than you complain about young people, that's what they're complaining. They might not know it. It's just like, you know, they remember all these things and they say, you know, it's like, why don't you remember that? I remember that. You know, well, no, they weren't alive yet. <laughs> and you'll do the same thing. And you get to be your thirty. Oh heck, you probably do it now. Freshman out it's so much easier today than when I was there. Yeah, everyone does. And that's why people just they, we think we forget those things. But think about this happens on a mass scale. All those old skills are gone, and pretty soon the only way they can survive is by killing beaver and trading it for their food. They went from being independent to what? And that's what you try to get down. What's going to happen is the tribes along the frontier are going to become dependent. Dependent on trade. But the only thing the colonists want are beaver. Set up. Here we get this now. What happens to the beaver? So like what happened in 1639? Right here. They all died. 1676, right here, all the beer, they killed them all. And now what can they trade? They got nothing. They got nothing that the colonists want. And, just as important, to the colonial point of view, to the colonial point of view, to their point of view, land ownership equals farming. But the, American, the tribes don't farm anymore. And they can't all of a sudden pick up farming because those skills are gone. Now I was wondering if like an apocalypse hits. Or we just don't have power for 24 hours. 
how fast we would turn into just anarchy because we have no skills. Yeah, I think if we didn't have electricity, I would say within three days, there'd be civil war. We'd be roaming the streets in gangs. I'd be the <laughs> and it would be all, all those bad uh, apocalyptic movies. We'd go and get all the football equipment and put that on and have the shoulder pads on. Because they all wear that, right? Yeah, we just roll these with And the story things I talk about that in hell where basically everyone would just die. And there's always some gay who would be going, that'd be so cool. Good, no one said it's fourth grade, someone did. All right, so just really quick this is land ownership. When does the bell ring? Oh shoot, we got, okay, let me finish this. <laughs> I blame society. So land ownership. So let me get this straight. And so once they quit killing the beaver and they don't farm to the colonists, they're wasting the land. They're wasting the land. And that would become the justification to take the land. So, got a little bit left to finish after the quiz. This is a really nice day out there, isn't it? I have good news for you. It's soon to be cold. Redskin? And your three quarterbacks ago. Yeah. Uh, no, I like it. Yeah. All right, Natalie, we got to talk. You had one responsibility with your, your dead beat brother. And what was that? Dixieland is Nixon land. Yeah. Does that affect us? No. Uh, Packers win one game and all the Packer fans come out of the woodwork. Good for you. And then the Seahawks lose to the hated Broncos. Yeah. Yeah. The hated Broncos. I'm not a Bronco fan. I didn't have a jersey, so I borrowed his so you, okay, then that's acceptable. You took it from your brother. I don't know how you get a favorite football team. I don't understand how it works. You know, I don't either. Even though I have one, I don't either. Wait, what's your favorite? The Chiefs. Oh. Because my dad liked the Chiefs. <laughs> yeah, that's how I do it. Yeah. Like the Colts. There's no real logic to it. So, what do we need? Like what kind of poster? Dixie land is Nixon land because it ripped. That and this alien is stuck to it and won't come It is totally stuck. Well, I was flinging it out. I don't know if I did work it. All right, everyone, sit down, be quiet. Flat shirt. They weren't cheering up. Do you like the Cardinals? Grandpa? Grandpa! I'll get a Ouija board. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I've been to Bush Stadium. How is the dog? Even though they're horrible now, but I'm a well. I watch them play. But there are different leagues. We got to have a look at it. We can't see it. We can't see it. It's. It's really cool. I mean, the river is maybe less than a quarter mile. Oh, yeah, good. Would this, stuff like this work? I didn't get like many quotes and stuff. That's fine. Yeah, just take your notes. You'll kind of call us. You turn that in, and all we're going to do with that is, and I'm giving everyone a but we'll do. You can do a little bit of a presentation on your talk. The big thing is we might have a lot of the same. But the thing that you 
on breathing, you know, as we use the And then if you can get your pictures or things like that, that'd be awesome. If you don't know, yeah, you can tell me. I mean, that'd be really cool. Hey, wait a second. I'm waiting on your other leg. Wait a minute. Wasn't that cast on the other leg last week? Oh, that's what you call What yeah. game are you playing, Mr. No. Oh. It's just Mr. Trying Barnes to get being sympathy. You know, we can all help you, but we're just sitting there and mocking you now. Then I'm going to take your crutches because it's going to be tough love. You know, my day, actually, crutches in school are awesome. Builds character, makes you stronger. They used to be good. All right, so I have good news for all of you. We'll go to that to the beauty, but let's talk very right quick before we get to that. Oh, I jumped the gun, so I do not forget to announce this. Tomorrow, we will have a quiz over that first section of that reading. That's still yours. So, Rifters up. So, from the beginning to the Golf of Tonkin. And it'll be a, just a basic little quiz, no more than 100 questions, I promise you. Uh, okay, how long more? So that can be only one question. No more. Yes. Just the information from that. To how I interpret the answer. No. So. You didn't rip it, did you? Why did you do that? I'm tired. Ninety percent of the answers are killed. Being tired, and then it's just it's the space out. Yeah. 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 Talk to me about it later. Do we have this kind of party sound? All right, so part B. Part B to that. So we have a quiz tomorrow and then interviews. Now, who has, who has somebody interviewed? Or who, raise your hand if you found somebody to interview or have already interviewed. Raise your hand. So, so most people have got somebody. So, so same deal. Talk to your parents or ask your parents if they know somebody who might um, might fit the qualification for the interview. Please get that done. I do give a little time on this because I understand if you have to call somebody, you have a relative somewhere to organize this. So we still have a couple weeks before they're due, and you're going to turn in basically a summary of the questions you ask, and they give a brief presentation. And if they have anything they want to give, like. I'm really excited to see the pictures. And I've got these from other presentation pictures and various things. It's going to be really cool. Our uniform. And yes. Can it be someone who just literally that time frame? You get a feeling, but I want something where that some kind of, if you can find a correct relationship. Yeah. But problem. Yes. Yes. That's fine. And so we just start getting that done. But look at some people already got it done. That's awesome. That's good. Basically, just a quick little presentation. Big things. You know, what did you find the most interesting? So there's gonna be a lot of, you know, we have the same kind of stories. We don't get to tell some of those. But. And also, you see why I showed this movie. The questions do ask a few of those things and about the war and what McNamara says. So let's go ahead and finish this and. I hope you enjoy this. Every time I see it, I always find something new. And one of the things I really like about it is, I think they do make mistakes in the McNamara. McNamara is duplicitous. But you know what? Except for us in here, outside of this room, there's a lot of duplicitous people. Inside this room, 
Only, only me. Yes. Oh, what was the last uh, one we have? Right for the bell rang. Yeah. Be prepared to examine your reasoning. Which, by the way, it sounds like another one. I think didn't they literally just come up? That came up and then we stopped it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you what? You got 40 seconds. Wait, where, you, where are you going? Go. Okay. <laughs> 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 